Good morning. My name is Packy. I'm the student pastor here at Eastside, and I'd like to welcome you to our live broadcast this morning. Uh, we understand that uh, today is a unique day, that, that you're joining us from uh, your living room or your kitchen or, or maybe even s sat up in your bed uh, watching this live broadcast, and we just want to welcome you uh, to this time. We're separated by distance, but we're not separated from the Lord, and He's in our presence, and we're in His, and so we're glad to be here uh, with you this morning. We just want to ask a couple of things of you this morning. As we worship, worship along with us. Our God's still worthy. If we're singing, sing. If we're praying, pray. And if we're uh, diving into God's Word, I just want to invite you to dive in with us and, uh, and not just be hearers or listeners, but be, be doers as well. So thank you for joining us today. Join me in prayer. Father, thank you so much for the opportunity that we have uh, to be here together as the church. Lord, you are certainly worthy of our worship. You're worthy of our time. Uh, you're worthy of our coming together by means of social media. So today, everything that we sing, everything that we pray, everything that we teach is for your glory. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Singing is one of the things that we would ordinarily do on a Sunday when we're gathered together, so it's worshipful, and it's unifying, and it's important that those two things continue to go on, so I do encourage you today to participate, and remember we're not singing to a screen, but we're singing to our great and sovereign Lord, and we're singing with our church body today, so let's do that. Water you turned into wine You opened the eyes of the blind There's no one like you None like you and Into the darkness you shine And out of the ashes we rise there's no one like you, none like you, and our God is greater, our God is stronger, God you are higher than any other, our God is healer, awesome in power, our God. Our God, and into the darkness you shine, and out of the ashes we rise. There's no one like you, none like you. And our God is greater, our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power. Our God, our God. And our God is greater, our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer. Awesome in power, our God, our God. And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? Our God is greater, our God is stronger, God you are higher than any other, our God is healer, awesome in power, our God, our God, our God is greater, our God is stronger, God you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, 
awesome in power, our God, our God. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love through the storm. He is Lord, Lord of all. When darkness seems to hide His face, I rest on His unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. My anchor holds within the veil. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love. And through the storm, He Lord, Lord of all, when he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone. Fall less I stand before the throne. Christ alone. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love. Through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of all. Christ alone, cornerstone. Christ alone, cornerstone. Weak made strong in the Savior's love. And through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of all. Good morning, Eastside family. It's good to be with you again on this Sunday for another time of worship and the study of God's Word. If you have your copy of God's Word, I would ask you to turn to Philippians chapter 4. As you're turning there, I want to sort of introduce you to someone that's kind of been an important person in my life, my great-grandmother. Her name was Julia Perkins Tarkington Smith. She may be one of the most interesting people I have ever had the privilege of knowing in my life. She was born March 12, 1901. She died in 2001, this month. She would have been 119 years age. The place where she was born was known as Indian Territory. It would be six years before the place where she lived and the place where she was born would actually be a state within the Union of the United States. 
Her parents were Father W.W. Perkins. He was a medical doctor, Vanderbilt trained, until he lost a hand in a farming accident, and then he had to move to being a farmer. Her mother was a Chickasaw woman named Laura Mobley, and my Chickasaw lineage comes through my great-great-grandmother, Laura Mobley. Her parents actually as children came over on the Trail of Tears. Grandmama was just an incredibly interesting woman to me, and she remains so. She was proud of her Chickasaw lineage, was very active in Chickasaw life. When she was a young woman, she actually signed the family up for the uh, Dawes Act, uh, which was a very wise move on her part and for her descendants. She was a woman of committed faith in Christ. She helped start a Sunday school class in an area where there was no church, and eventually that class would lead to the planting of a non-denominational church. She was a gifted crafter and quite adept with quilting. <laughs> And she was a die-hard, avid fan of professional wrestling. And no matter what you would say, she would never relent from the fact that it was not stage; it was real. She believed to her dying breath that professional wrestling was real and all of the things they did and all the outcomes of those matches were real competitive wrestling. And if you wanted to get her ire up, hint anything along the lines otherwise, and she would tell you and set you straight. She would outlive two husbands. She would outlive all of her seven siblings. She would face the tragedy of burying her one and only grandson. She was a woman acquainted with a life of hardship and trouble. When I was a boy, she would tell stories about her life as a young woman in Indian Territory and then in Oklahoma, and it would sound like something out of a Western movie or out of a book or a novel. It was just fascinating to me. But despite all these interesting things about her life, maybe what was most interesting to me to this day was the span of her life and all that she witnessed and all that she experienced. During her life, she witnessed the place of her birth becoming a part of the United States officially as a state. She would live through two presidential assassinations. She would live through five either wars or major conflicts of our country. For example, she was 13 years old when World War I broke out. She was 38 years old when World War II started. She, live, she would live through the Korean conflict. She would live through the Gulf War. She would live through Vietnam. She would witness the rise of the atomic bomb. She would be one of those to watch the first man walk on the moon. She would witness the rise of the computer digital age. She would ro witness the rise of communism in the Cold War. What an incredible life. But two things during the span of her life I think are notable from her life, and I think sort of help us this morning for where we are in our world today. Grandmama lived through the Great Depression, as many in her day did. This would begin with the crash of the stock market in 1929 and would end roughly with the start of our country getting into World War II. She also lived through the 1918 influenza pandemic, commonly known as the Spanish flu. This was a global pandemic about a year in length, it is estimated that 500 million, one-third of the world's population became infected with this virus. The number of deaths is estimated to be at least 50 million worldwide, approximately 675,000 within this country. So Grandmama lived through two events that are kind of some, some things that are happening in our world today. This great physical pandemic that is sweeping our nation and our world and the ensuing economic aftermath that this pandemic is creating. When I think about Julia Perkins Tarkington Smith's life and some takeaways, a couple of things that cross my mind are these. One, 
tough times, truly trying, challenging times are just a part of human existence. It doesn't matter when you live. It doesn't matter where you live. This is just part of living in our world, in a fallen world. There are going to be tough, trying times. And these times may be locally centered, and they may, they may be more nationally or globally imp, um, influential, but they're going to happen. These kinds of events are going to happen. And another takeaway from Great Grandma's life is this. We can get through these times. We will make it through these times. Times like these, we will get through them. I don't think it's a question of whether or not will we get through them. I think the better question is how will we get through them? And even more importantly, how will we practice our faith? And how will God help us and be with us and work with us as we make our way through these tough, tough, trying times. And there are many places in the Word of God where we can turn to find instruction for this, but I want us to turn our thoughts this morning to Philippians chapter 4. So take your copy of God's Word if you have it handy. We're going to read, we're going to focus primarily on verses 6 through 7, but to put this within its context, I'm going to start reading in, at the end of verse 4 through verse 5 so follow along in your copy of God's word as I read aloud beginning in Philippians chapter 4 verse 4 rejoice in the Lord always I will say it again rejoice let your graciousness be known to everyone the Lord is near don't worry about anything but in everything through prayer and petition with thanksgiving present your requests to God and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So we understand that living in a fallen world is going to require enduring times of trouble, times of trial, times of struggle and challenge. I think the challenge for us is how does God want us to navigate? How does God want us to get through these tough and trying times? So in the passage that we read this morning, I, I think it's important for us to understand we're going to talk about worry, but the issue of worry is not the primary point here. I think the Apostle Paul is wanting us to see in this passage that God intends for us to navigate these things in the context of his peace that it is possible in fact it is a real possibility that we can go through the times that are before us now a global pandemic with a great measure of peace that God will work in our midst that God will work in our lives in such a way that there's a lot of uncertainty there's a lot of unsettledness but in the midst of the uncertainty and the unsettledness it is possible to have peace. Paul is instructing a church that is going through two levels of trouble and trial. In the Philippian church, number one, they are a church under persecution. And so they are experiencing some troubles and trials from without. Circumstances are conspiring against them, working against them. There are people that are out to hurt and harm them to diminish them in their walk of faith with Christ and their, their witness of Christ to the world. They don't want that to happen. The Philippians are enduring this. But they're also experiencing some turmoil within. We know from other places in this letter that there's some division and strife within the church. In fact, earlier in chapter 4, Paul calls out two women and, and implores them, asks them to come together in a sense of unity. So here you have the issue of a church that has trouble and trial from the outside and trouble and trials from within. And the man that's writing this letter is, his, is himself experiencing some trouble and trials because he's penning this letter from a Roman prison. And so in the midst of Paul's own personal experience and in the midst of the dynamics that are at work without and within the Philippian church, he tells them, first of all, rejoice in the Lord 
always. I'll say it again, rejoice. So evidently the expectation is that in the midst of trouble and trial, it is possible to rejoice in the Lord. And then he presses into it a little further in verse 5 when he says, Let your graciousness be known to everyone. So in the midst of trouble and trial, when it might be fitting or we feel that it might be fitting to lash out, to push back, to be caustic or rough, he says, No, rejoice in the Lord. I'll say it again. Rejoice always. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. And then he says, The Lord is near don't worry about anything. Evidently, according to what Paul is writing here and some other things that we see in, in this letter, the enemy of peace, particularly the enemy of peace in a trouble trying time, is worry. And so that's why he gives this command, don't worry about anything. So he gives a positive command, Rejoice. He gives a second command, be gentle with one another. And then he moves into this command, somewhat of a negative prohibition, stop worrying. The circumstances around them created worries. They were being persecuted. Uh, maybe they were worried about what's going to happen from other people to us. What are they going to do to us? They're worried about it. Maybe the personal and relational struggles within the church. It's circumstances within their fellowship were creating worry. Paul is saying, you have some disruptions, divisions. Your harmony within the fellowship may be not what we would want. We're going to deal with that. But don't worry about it. In the midst of times in their day and in the midst of times in our day, maybe one of the biggest temptations that we as followers of Jesus will need to navigate is this issue of worry. Now, last week I talked about this out of Matthew chapter 6, and Jesus is teaching on the struggles and trials of everyday life potentially creating worries, and sort of dovetailing on that. You may recall that I mentioned that the English word worry comes from an old German word, and it means to choke, to choke off. The biblical idea catches that, but it also advances it somewhat by the idea of carrying burdens that are in the future or carrying burdens of the unknown that we that we worry about things that are before us out there are we worried about things that are beyond our control we're worried about things that we just don't know anything about and somehow we think if I worry about what I don't know, if I worry about the future, if I worry about issues that are beyond my ability to influence, somehow my worrying will affect these things. And that is not true. God did not create us with the capacity to carry the burden of the future. We don't know the future. We cannot carry that. We were not made that way. We do not have the capacity to carry the weight of what we do not know, of what is beyond our ability to control, and certainly the future. When we worry, we engage in behavior that is pointless. Worry does not change the circumstances. So the Philippians, worrying about persecution, did not change the persecution. The Philippians, worrying about the disruption of their fellowship within, did not change the disruption of the disunity within the church. Paul, worrying about being in prison, wasn't going to change the fact that he was incarcerated. Worry does not affect the circumstances. In fact, we also know that worrying is harmful. It has negative impact upon our health. It has negative impact upon our well-being. So when we worry... We let trials and troubles overwhelm us. And the consequence of that is that we forfeit our God-given peace. Worrying is the opposite and enemy of peace. And peace is the antidote that eliminates and removes worry from our life. When we worry... We succumb to the enemy of peace, and we forfeit our God-given peace. No one ever says, you know, 
my worrying, my anxiousness made my situation better. No one ever says that because it doesn't happen. No one ever says worrying helped me. Worrying improved my situation. Never happens. No one ever says worrying made me a better person because it doesn't. It never happens. Worrying does not help us deal with the troubles and trials and challenges of life. Never has, never will. God's strategy for us for dealing with troubling, trying times is mentioned in this text. Do not worry about anything, verse 6, but in everything, through prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. God's strategy for troubling times is prayer. It is not profoundly beyond our capacity to imagine this. It is profound in what it means and its practice. God's answer, God's alternative, God's antidote to worry is prayer. And the occasion for praying is not always just when things are going well or things are going right or things seem to be going our way. Paul says in this passage, don't worry about anything, but in everything through prayer. In everything. In the language of the New Testament, it is an open-ended expression. It means in absolutely every conceivable context, in every way that you might think of it, you should be praying. And so that means in every conceivable context in which things are going extremely well, pray. Likewise, when things aren't going well, when there are troubles, when there are trials, when there are challenges, when there is a global pandemic, and when there's economic chaos, and when we are separated and can't get together in ways that we're used to, in ways that we would like, and when we can't gather together as a church family, pray. In fact, those are the circumstances that we should be praying, that are most conducive to pray. And Paul says three things about this. Present your requests to God. Present your prayers to God. Present your petitions to God. In this context, I think the three references are all-encompassing in every facet of prayer. That is, in your conversations with God, in your petitions, in your requests, take the situation to God. So if you're bothered by all the news of the pandemic, turn off the television and pray. If you are feeling the weight of some physical trials during all of this, certainly seek medical treatment and pray. If you're discouraged that we can't get together for our times of corporate worship and our times of mutual Bible study together face to face, pray. If you're feeling isolated and disconnected from family and friends and from your church family and that while social media and phone calls and text messages and emails might help on some level but you're still feeling socially disconnected, relationally disjointed, pray. If you're just overwhelmed by all that is going on that seems unsettling and uncertain, pray in everything, take all of these things to God in prayer. Now, for the East Side Baptist family, you will know that I have spent a great deal of time in the previous months teaching on prayer. In the time of this transition in our relocation efforts, I felt strongly and still do that the only way that we're going to get through this relocation transition time is through praying. And many, many in the church family have risen up and have embraced this. In fact, we have made prayer one of the four pillars of our church. Who could have envisioned that not only were those teachings preparatory and needful for our time of transition, our time of relocation, but they immediately speak into where we are nationally, globally, and in our community. That the temptation in these times is to worry. And yet, in the providential leading of God, we spend a great deal of time equipping us for relocation but also 
for this time of dealing with separation and trying to navigate the pandemic and the ensuing ongoing economic challenges that are coming from all this, it is a chaotic, troubling time. I believe that looking back now that God was not only preparing us for relocation in those teachings on prayer, but he was preparing us for now. The immediate issues before us, this time of trouble, this time of trial, this time of challenge. So if you're looking for something to do that you're bored at home, go back and review those videos, those social media postings on prayer. Refresh your mind, refresh your memory on this issue of prayer, and then pray. Pray. Read a good book. Pray. Play games with your family and pray. Spend time building community with your family and through social media interaction with others. And in the midst of all this, pray, pray, pray. The linchpin that moves us, the fulcrum that moves us from worrying to peace, peace in God and peace with God, is prayer. God's strategy to equip us to navigate troubling, trying times is prayer. And to pray with gratitude in everything through prayer and petitions with thanksgiving. That may require great steps of faith for us right now because we may look around us and see things that don't necessarily engender gratitude. Maybe you and your family are experiencing some of those economic hardships and you're not feeling too grateful about the challenges and trials that brings to you. Maybe the disconnect from close family members is creating some emotional, psychological hardships for you and you're not feeling too grateful. It may be something else along those lines. It, it might just be that in prayer, by faith, you declare, I thank you, God, for, and you just begin to pray that prayer. That you're overwhelmed by the situation, you're feeling the burden of the troubles and trials. Start here with a simple prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you for what you have provided for us. I thank you for what you're doing in our lives right now. I thank you for a church family that is cognizant of me in my life and, and they're aware of where we are and, and they're reaching out to me. And you just begin by faith to pray your way through the troubles and trials, the uncertainties and unsettledness of where we are today. You're doing that by expressions, by statements of gratitude. God's strategy to help us to navigate these troubling, trying times is prayer. God's gift to us for troubling, trying times is peace. But in everything, through prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ. It seems counterintuitive, but according to the Word of God, peace can be had, peace can be experienced in unsettling, trying times and circumstances. We know this doesn't mean the absence of conflict because he's writing to people that are in the midst of persecution. Their situation was not going to change anytime soon. They still were going to be persecuted. We understand that peace is not the removal of trying, difficult times, because Paul is writing from a Roman prison. And Paul did not envision his situation changing anytime soon. In this situation, in this context, peace has a relational dynamic to it. Present your request to God and the peace of God. This can mean a peace that God gives, or it can mean a peace that is unto God, peace related to God. I think both are true, and I think both are embedded in this meaning. The peace that comes from God connects us to God, 
And so in this situation, it's not that, well, peace means all my problems are solved. Peace means all the troubles are gone. Peace means the trials are over because they're not, and they're not today. This kind of peace means that in the midst of trouble, God will do a work in our lives to move us in a relationship with him such that we can experience peace with him and through him. Now what's interesting about this peace is that evidently, according to Paul, this peace is better than knowledge. This peace transcends information. So for years, I always thought peace that surpasses all understanding means that the experience of God's peace is beyond human ability to describe. And I think that's true, that when God gives us his peace, it is so good and great that words fail us, that words begin to break down, that I I don't have enough ways to describe this peace. I think that's true. But I also think this means that peace that surpasses all understanding can mean in trying, challenging times and unexpected hardships, what I really need is peace. Not an explanation and not a good idea. And now I'm all for explanations and good ideas. But when we look at our world, when we look at our situation, when we look at all that's going on, I don't just need an explanation because after the explanation is given, there are still troubles and trials and challenges. I need peace. You need peace. Peace is better than knowledge. Peace is built on good knowledge, a well-informed faith. But through that, we are moved to a place where we enjoy God's peace and can do so even in the midst of troubles and trials. The peace described by Paul is not something we create. It's not something that is manufactured. We don't make this. We don't create this. This is peace from God, peace with God, a peace unto God. To put it another way, On this day, when the global pandemic is sweeping our world, and more and more people seem to be getting sick, and the death count rises, and the economic dynamics are at work, that people are now losing jobs, and families are struggling financially, and we don't know how this is all going to play out. In the midst of all of this, Peace is God's presence with us. Peace is what we need. The troubles and challenges will still be with us tomorrow, but in the midst of all of this, the promise is a peace. And this peace is a stout, strong peace. We're told peace is going to guard our hearts and our minds. Paul uses a word here, that is taken from military jargon of his day. It's a term that refers to a garrison of soldiers on guard to guard a city or a military base. This is the word that he describes the value of peace in our life, that God's peace surrounds our heart, surrounds our mind in such a way that it guards us from the enemy of worry And it guards us in a way to enable us to navigate the trials and challenges of our situation and move move us forward. The peace of God guards our hearts and minds from the enemies of worry and anxiety and unsettledness and uncertainness and loss of assurance. The final thing that we want to note about this is God's promise for troubling and trying times. Ultimately, it's his presence. Four times in these two short verses, we read about something related to God. In verse 5, the Lord is near. In verse 6, it is to God. Verse 7, it is a peace from God. It, It guards us in Christ Jesus. These statements place all that Paul is commanding and teaching within the reality 
within the sphere of a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. You want freedom from worry? It's found in Christ. You want to be able to pray your way effectively through the troubles and trials of life? That also is found in Christ. And you want a peace that's like a garrison that guards your mind and your heart? You want that? That also is found in Christ. It's kind of like the whole dynamic of this peace with God, dispelling the enemy of worry, that all of this is framed. The Lord is near. The peace that guards hearts and minds in Christ, at the beginning, at the end, and all that's in between, occurs within the context. If this is what you want, if this is how you want to navigate, there's only one place this is going to happen. And that is in the work of Christ in his life for his followers. The promise of God is that the only way we're going to get through these trying, challenging, difficult times with peace is in the presence and power of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. So let me wrap this up by sharing five takeaways. Number one, recognize that life will always have troubles and trials. There's no such thing as a trouble-free life. It was true for Paul. It was true for the Philippian church. It was true for my great-grandmother and for many of our ancestors, all of our ancestors, and it's true for us. We're going to have circumstantial troubles, things outside of us beyond our ability to control. We're going to experience relationship troubles and trials. That's just life. Recognize that life is always going to have troubles and trials. Secondly, be aware of the temptation to worry and thereby forfeit your peace. It's a real temptation. It's a daily struggle and trial, especially in days like today. Every day, we, the followers of Jesus, will be faced with the temptation. Am I going to worry about this stuff or am I going to choose to pray my way through it and enjoy the peace with God? Be aware, the temptation is real. Third, the goal of overcoming troubles or trials is not an explanation. Rather, it's peace. So while explanations are helpful, while knowledge is good up to a certain point, at the end of it all, what I really need, what you really need, what Paul says we need is a peace that surpasses all understanding a garrison kind of peace that establishes us in a way that we're able to navigate this in the way that God intends for us to. Fourth, guard your peace through prayer. If you want to guard that peace, if you want peace to do guard duty for you, then you actualize that peace, that you experience the reality of that peace in the context of prayer. And then finally, true peace, lasting peace, the kind of peace we were created to have is found only in Jesus Christ. If you are not a follower of Jesus and you're watching this, I would invite you to go to God, repent of your sin, confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. He will forgive you. He will give you the gift of the new birth and in the context of that you can have the peace of God by having peace with God but that's only found in Jesus Christ and for those of us that are followers of Jesus we need a timely reminder in these troubling trying times I want to have peace even in the midst of all this chaos and unsettledness I want to have peace that also for us is found by living lives in Christ I'm praying this for you, and I'm praying this for me. And so let me conclude our time this morning by leading us all in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the life that you've given to us by grace through faith in your Son. I thank you for the gift of peace with you the gift of peace from you. 
and even in these troubling and unsettling times that we can be a people of peace. And I would ask that you do this work of peace in our life and that you would do it in such a way that our peace with you from you is a testimony and a witness to a watching world that it does not have this peace. They have chaos. They have unsettledness. They have lack of assurance. We all experience similar troubles and trials. Let our peace guard our hearts and minds and let our peace be a loud, resounding declaration of the glory of your Son, the greatness of your gospel, and the work of grace that you can do in our lives. I pray for the East Side Baptist family. I pray that you work peace in them and through them. I pray this for me, and I pray this for all the church family. And Father, if there is someone watching this, whenever they're watching it, that doesn't know your son, I pray that they would experience peace with you that can only come to them through Jesus Christ. Send gospel witness to them. Let your spirit work a work of conviction and righteousness in their life. Lead them to repent of their sin and to confess Jesus Christ as their Lord. We need peace. I pray that you make it so. And I pray that we're faithful to pray about it and to embrace it. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Appreciate that, Dr. Norman. Appreciate him uh, sharing with us uh, about how you uh, and your family can certainly have peace in these uh, trying times. So, we, again, we just want to thank you so much for joining us today. I uh, just got a couple announcements as we prepare uh, to, uh, to dismiss for today. Number one, uh, normally at this point in service, we would prepare uh, to receive our morning offering. But because we are not together uh, in person, uh, we're having to do that a few different ways. And, uh, there, in fact, there's about five different ways uh, that you can give to the ongoing ministries of our church. You probably got a letter about this uh, last week in the mail. And if you didn't, uh, the letter will be there shortly at your home. You can see these on the screen. Uh, we would just encourage you to just to be faithful in giving uh, to the ministries that are ongoing here at the church. And, uh, and if we can help you with that, then you'd let us know uh, if we can clarify any of that. Also, our staff has been meeting regularly and praying and trying to plan and figure out the best course of action moving forward uh, as it pertains uh, to, to the situation we find ourselves in. And uh, based on the recommendation of both the national government and also our local government, here in the state of Arkansas, we feel it best uh, to uh, continue to worship together in an online setting, much like we did today, uh, until the end of April. Uh, so again, until uh, the end of April, uh, our plan is to continue to worship together in this way. There'll be other videos throughout the week, other opportunities for you uh, to engage uh, with us. Uh, certainly, if you, if you need anything at all, feel free to contact any of us pastors or the church office, and we'll certainly do all we can to help. Um, meet any and all needs that, that you or your family may be having uh, in this time. But uh, just based on the recommendation from the government, we just felt like it's probably just best for us to, to continue in this online forum uh, through the month of April. If something changes, uh, we will certainly reconvene as, as soon as we're able to. And uh, so if something changes in that time frame, we will notify you, let you know. Uh, but until the month of, uh, until the end of April, we will meet uh, in this forum. So again, thank you so much uh, for visiting with us today. If you want to share this video uh, on your social media page, we would encourage you to do so also on the uh, church website. The video will be up in the next day or two. And also we have a YouTube channel. Uh, and this video will also be available on the YouTube channel in the days ahead. So again, thanks so much for joining us. You guys have a blessed week.